Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our data science workshop. Uh, my name is Sasha and I'm working for the Levagon Tokyo. I'm very happy to have this joint workshop today with the Bitcrete. Very happy to welcome uh, the amazing team from Bitcrep to develop to deliver this uh, workshop to you. Um, but before we move to the workshop by itself, we probably do a very short introduction. Uh, first for the team who will be assisting you today and then for their uh, two companies which are delivering this workshop to you today. As I said, my name is Sasha. I'm in charge of the events and partnerships in Levagon Tokyo. Also from my side today, uh, we have Truni, who is a manager for the data science uh, bootcamp in Tokyo. He just waved his hand. Truni, maybe you would like to do some introduction? I'm good. Uh, but yes, I'll be running the our first actually batch of data science uh, in Tokyo that's starting actually next week on Monday. So very excited about this. If anyone's interested, uh, wants info about it, just don't hesitate to reach out in the chat and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Good luck for the workshop to uh, the rest of the team. Yay, cool. Thank you so much, Tony. And maybe big great team, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I re we really appreciate you coming today and uh, talking to us and uh, learning a little bit more about machine learning and AI competitions. Um, so I'll just share a quick introduction. Um, so Uh, yes, like, they, like uh, Sasha mentioned, um, we're working here at BitGrid. So hi, everyone. My name is Kelly. Um, BitGrid is a data science platform. So we mainly do AI competitions, and we also do um, a job board and recruitment for data science um, and also data analysts. Um, and we are kind of working towards a goal of having a fully functional AI marketplace. Um, and on that marketplace, uh, engineers and companies can come together and exchange um, they can exchange models, AI algorithms, things like we're going to be learning today. Um, and the companies can make payments for that on a blockchain platform. Um, and then just a little bit about myself. My name is Kelly. Um, I'm from California, San Jose, actually. And I um, first came to Japan right after graduating from Berkeley um, in 2012. Uh, I came here on the JET program. I started IT recruitment back in 2017. And I joined Bitgrid last year. Um, so again, it's really great to have all of you here today. And I'm looking forward to um, having Jorge teaching us all a little bit more about uh, machine learning. Thank you. Hey, um, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Jorge. I'll be, the, I'll be running this, uh, the technical part of this workshop today. Um, yeah, I work uh, same as Kelly. I work in Bitrate, uh, which is a data science platform that has competitions, um, job postings, and what we want to achieve in the not so distant future is to have a fully functional AI marketplace where real companies can uh, buy and exchange uh, algorithms on using blockchain technology. Um, uh, so what it concerns us now, it's basically, I mean, the, the AI competitions part is basically Kaggle, if you have heard about it. Um, and about myself, uh, well, um, my name is Jorge. I am from Chile in South America. Um, I'm living here in Tokyo, Japan, uh, since this year, um, February, a little bit before the pandemic um, started to get really uh, bad. Um, yeah, I can, I st I've st been studying uh, some Japanese too, so um, I always wanted to have an opportunity to work here and well, th thanks to Bitgrid, I have the opportunity to work as a data scientist, which is something that I love um, here in Japan, with, uh, which is a place that I've always wanted to work uh, in. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jorge. And also, there is a comment in the chat that um, actually some people came uh, to this uh, chat, to this uh, meeting from another link. That's true. We decided to change our Zoom link due to the high number of participants who registered for the uh, event. That's why we changed it. Today, I'm so sorry for the inconvenience, but uh, all the links on the platforms that you registered are uh, already upgraded. So I hope a lot of people will shift to this Zoom. 
uh, by the end of this self uh, introduction. Thank you so much, guys. And this is the time for me to do a very short um, introduction for the Nevagon. For those who are in, who are just on the beginning of their way of learning data science, who for those who want to become a data scientist or data analyst, who are interested in the data science education, uh, the Levagon Tokyo uh, is launching a data science bootcamp, and we will we will start in one week. Um, so I will do a very short um, intro. If I can share the screen. Um, Okay, and uh, can you see my screen now? Guys, please show me some thumbs up if you see my screen. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, good, 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 good. There was no response, so I was afraid that no one is seeing it. So. Um, first of all, let me introduce you about the Levagon. What is Levagon? It's a global coding bootcamp. And what we do, we teach people how to code, how to build products, uh, how to build web applications and also data science uh, projects. And we do it in uh, two formats, in the full-time and the part-time. We also run two types of the bootcamp. The first is uh, the one, the oldest, uh, it's a web development bootcamp, and the, another one is a data science bootcamp that we launched just recently, as I said, and also as Truni, our new uh, data science bootcamp manager. Um, so as I mentioned, we are a global bootcamp, so we have campuses in 39 cities around the world, and since founding, we have uh, more than 8,000 radiates who came through our bootcamps, who built a lot of applications, and who also met, uh, launched a lot of startups. And uh, since a lot of them were searching for a job, they after the bootcamp, they ended up working for companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, and many others listed on this slide. Uh, a little bit about the Levagon Japan. Uh, we founded uh, Levagon Japan uh, four years ago. Since that time, we had over uh, 200 alumni graduated from our bootcamp. Um, we usually have a very diverse uh, groups. Every batch we have from seven to 14 nationalities. Uh, people from the different age groups join our boot camps from 18 to 50, but the people we see more are usually in their late uh, 20s or early 30s. That's where people decide to change their career or they want to upskill themselves. We also run um, a dynamic type community. We have workshops and, techs, uh, and talks almost every week. Um, so as as you see today, we have a joint workshop with Big Grid, and I'm very, very proud of our first joint data science workshop. Um, as I mentioned, yes, two formats that we have, web development and data science. Um, after the bootcamp, a lot of people can uh, search for a job and find a job as a developer or data scientist, depending on the bootcamp they join. 10% the of the alumni usually become freelancers. 10% uh, launch their own startups. Um, so this is just about uh, our upcoming data science bootcamp. I believe if you want to uh, ask more questions about it, you can ask Truni uh, directly. This is just a brief introduction. What kind of curriculum we offer um, and what kind of outcomes uh, we can guarantee you, you after the bootcamp, you can become a data analyst, data engineer, data scientist, or data manager. And you can also kickstart your career as a freelance data scientist. Um, this is a lot about our community. We have a huge community. So after the graduation, all our alumni are sticking in the same Slack community where you can ask questions about everything. And um, this is this is probably the end. Sorry for taking your time. Um, any case, if you have questions about the upcoming data science bootcamp in Tokyo, feel free to uh, click the link that, share, that Tony just shared in the chat or ask him questions on me directly. And my part now is over. I'm giving the microphone to Jorge for the workshop by itself. Jorge, please. Thank you, Sasha. Um, okay, so let's now jump into the 
the workshop itself. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, so I hope everyone can see here now. Um, okay, so we already introduced ourselves. Um, so in today's webinar, what we're going to learn is um, basically why and how to join uh, data science competitions, um, how to design and train a simple machine learning model for a competition, uh, how to create a solution using our model and submit it to the platform. And we're going to be discussing, um, showing a few examples on how we can improve our score uh, using more data. So what is a data science competition? Um, a data science competitions are fun and structured ways to solve real world problems. Um, these are not only great for organizations who can solve problems via crowdsourcing, uh, but they're also great for participants for many reasons. So first, uh, it is one of the best ways to learn data science or anything for that matter, which is by doing it yourself. Um, second, you can, being, you can win uh, big prizes if you submit a solution that's good enough, of course. Um, another reason is that you can actually experience working with real world problems that organizations cannot solve easily by themselves. That's why they uh, put them on a data science platform like Bidwit. And although some of the boring part of uh, data science is already done, uh, most of the time you still need to understand and handle the data before attempting to put it into a machine learning model, uh, which is just like in the real world. Um, finally, I think recruiters and companies uh, love applicants uh, with experience in data science competitions. So they are a very good addition to your resume or your GitHub or LinkedIn. Well, especially if you get a, a good score. Okay, so now let's talk uh, about uh, today's competition. Um, so this competition is sponsored by Japanese company Atrae, uh, who are the creators of an app called Yenta. And what is Yenta? So Yenta is a professional matching app. Um, in simple terms, it's basically like Tinder, but for business and professional relationships. Um, it is quite big in Japan, and it just now launched in India. Um, so to give an example of how it works, uh, let's say I have a business idea, and I'm a programmer, but I need someone with a business background to actually sell my idea. So I can use Yenta then to look for someone with such background that is in turn looking for a programmer. And then Yenta's recommendation algorithm uh, shows me 10 profiles every day based on my profile using their current uh, recommendation algorithm. And I can either swipe right if I am interested in a profile or left if I am not really interested. And if we match, this is um, I'm interested and the other person is interested too. Then we can arrange a meeting to discuss potential business opportunities. Uh, after we meet, I can leave a review of the other person and will be review, re reviewed accordingly by the other person too. And well, if things go well, we may end up forming our own company or something like that. So uh, that, with that information, what is the goal of this competition? Um, the goal is to improve their current recommend, uh, profile recommendation algorithm. So more concretely, uh, we want to predict the level of compatibility of two given users. So uh, more precisely, um, given two users, let's call them user A and user B, you want to predict their compatibility as one of these four classes. Um, so class zero <clears throat> will be user A and user B will not match. Uh, class one will be user A and user B will match. Um, class two will be user A and B will match and meet, but user A will leave a bad review of user B. And finally, class three will be user A and B will match and meet, and user A will leave a good review of user B. Okay. So um, if you haven't already, uh, let's try to join the competition now. Um, okay, so first, please go to the, the following URL. This is on the slides here. Um, can you hear it? In the in the chat, maybe. 
Oh yeah, totally. Um, then um, <clears throat> you go to the upper right corner. Um, if you the, 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 there should be a button that says participate, but if you don't have an account, uh, you need to register first. So we're going to wait a couple of minutes for people to register. So maybe you have some questions uh, now. We have a question mm -hmm. um, from Naveen Gabriel. He asks, does Yenta include matching based on experience? I would say yes, <clears throat> job experience. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so that's that's something that we are going to see now. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a, they currently have their own AL, AI uh, profile recommendation algorithm, but it's maybe not as good as it could be. So what this competition is all about is improving that. So we are going, to, we will see that we have uh, different kinds of data of the GNTAP that we can use to actually um, see if two profiles are a good match based on education and work and uh, why they joined the app uh, based on the age of people and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, potentially yes, that's the, that's the answer. Um, Right, and then Aaron asks, uh, mm -hmm. with this competition, is there an NDA on some of the data? Are we able to share notebooks on GitHub, et cetera? Um, yeah, there's an NDA. There's an NDA that has to be signed as it's uh, here in the slide. Um, I am not fully sure what does the NDA, NDA cover. Um, I think probably you can't share the notebook somewhere else. Yeah, I'm gonna guess no, but I'll, t I'll double check that um, and get back to you, Aaron. Yeah, <laughs> good question. Very good. Um, okay, maybe we can continue. Um, Okay, um, I'll continue for now. Um, if you haven't registered yet, uh, don't worry. There's still plenty of time. Um, okay, so if you register, uh, then you have to click on the participate button on the upper right corner. Um, you have to accept the non-disclosure agreement. Um, I think it says there what's uh, <laughs> allowed and not allowed. Um, and once you... Um, accept the non-disclosure agreement and join the competition. You have to refresh the page because I think uh, if you don't do that, it won't show up. And a new tab called resources should show up. So I'm gonna quickly show here. So this is the competition um, page. And when you refresh, you should see this tab over here. Uh, and here you can download the data. Um, so the data is quite big, it's almost 600 megabytes, so it could take a while depending on your internet connection. So please start downloading it now and meanwhile, uh, please go to overview and take a quick look at the rules. Just in case. Meanwhile, we don't load the data.
Okay. Um, just continue now. Um, so yeah, I hope you had a quick look at the rules. Um, let's now um, let's now talk about a bit about the the data of this competition. So all the all the details are on the guide plan section of the competition page. Um, okay, so this data is a subset of all the Yenta data. Of course, not all the data um, is included, but most of what we thought could potentially be used to increase our prediction algorithm should be here, like education, stuff like that. So naturally, we have user data, uh, but we also have other types of data, like users' interaction data. Uh, users' data include things like age, biography, education, uh, work history, uh, skills, etc. And users' interaction data includes information related to a pair of users, like swipes. Uh, for example, if user A uh, is interested in user B or not. Uh, reviews, for example, what was your what was user A's opinion of user B after they met? And stuff like that. And well, now you may be wondering how is this data public? Like, what about user privacy? Um, well, uh, all this data is, of course, anonymized to protect users' privacy. Uh, for example, instead of using the school names, um, these are replaced by school IDs that only Yenta knows. For example, let's say Tokyo University could be ID number 134. Um, the same thing was done with companies. So each company name is mapped to a particular ID, uh, also for things like skills. For example, the data science skill could be ID number 73 or something. That's just an example. Um, while other things like age, for example, can stay the same since uh, we ha already have the user ID, which is already anonymous. Um, okay, cool. But what about the text columns? Um, as you may see here, I've written vectorized text, but what does that mean? Um, as you may know, to train or predict using a machine learning model, uh, data has to be in the form of numbers. Okay, so not text or files or emojis or any other thing, like numbers. So to be able to use um, text data in our models, we need to convert it to, into numbers. And how many of these numbers we're going to use to represent this text needs to be fixed. We need a fixed amount of numbers to represent any text that we want to use um, in our model. So we do this with uh, something called text vectorization. Okay, so what is text vectorization? Um, I won't go into too much detail since I'm not really an expert here, uh, but there are a couple of popular ways to do this. Uh, for example, you could have a big dictionary with all the words in the language of the data you're using. And for example, the English language or Spanish language or whatever, and count the number of appearances of uh, each word in a sentence to get an array of numbers. Uh, but the resulting array would be the size of the number of words in your vocabulary with mostly zeros, uh, since in most, um, most words in a language uh, do not appear in a short text. Um, but, and that, of course, is uh, too big for practical reasons, like to have an array uh, with most zeros that is the size of a dictionary. Uh, so there are other ways to do this. So a common way to do this is something called um, word to vec, which basically maps words uh, into a numerical space. So for example, a three-dimensional space. Um, so that in a way that semantically similar words are close to each other in the space, and semantically different words are far away from each other. Um, so now the thing is the different coordinates in this space represent different forms in which words can uh, differ. So for example, the word man uh, would be a point in this three-dimensional space that is close to other points representing the word woman. Uh, but they would fundamentally differ in the gender dimension, right? Um, so this means that other words like king and queen uh, would differ mostly along the same dimension, right? Uh, because they are basically a very similar word, but uh, that only changes in gender. 
um, but they will be close uh, in other dimensions since they are very similar in any other ways. For example, they are both uh, terms related to royalty. Um, so in this other example here uh, in the middle, we can see the um, another dimension which represents the verb tense uh, or similar temporal characteristics of a word. So naturally words like man or woman wouldn't be very different along these dimensions since they are atemporal, but words like walked and walking or swam and swimming would differ um, similarly along this dimension. Uh, on the right side image here, uh, we can see that man and woman share very similar values for three out of the co four coordinates in this uh, fourth dimension space. So this is a different space, this, this has four dimensions. Um, we see that only the last one appears to be different. Um, so we can assume that the last one encodes uh, the gender difference. Um, if we take a look at the coordinates for king and man, um, we see that they actually shared, did share this last coordinate and also the third one. So what could we assume uh, from this? We could assume, for example, that the first two columns have to do with the semantics of these words. Uh, like if they have anything to do with royalty, for example. Uh, and we also think that the third coordinate encodes that these are humans, for example, which applies to the three of them and so on. So in general, uh, we use much bigger dimensions uh, for in, in practice. Uh, so it's, for example, for in our data, we are using 300 dimensions. So of course it's much more than three or four. Um, also in our example, uh, we're not working with individual words, but with sentences. And actually we didn't really use word to vec uh, but some other more uh, current and sophisticated algorithms, but they basically just expand this idea of numerical spaces. Um, so if you're interested, uh, the study of text vectorization and other things uh, is the main subject of something called natural language processing or NLP, which is a whole world in itself uh, within machine learning. So if you want to learn more about this, we'll share uh, some links for you to check out later. Um, the important thing here is that we have a numerical representation of text that is quite consistent and allows us to have similar numerical vectors for similar texts. Okay, so um, to train our model um, using the competition data, we will be using an algorithm called random forest. Uh, some of you may have heard about it. It is a quite simple, but very powerful algorithm that can be used in many different situations, especially in classification problems like this one. Um, it is widely used to run quick tests with uh, the data since there isn't much tuning required to achieve great performance like compared to neural networks or other sophisticated algorithms where you have to tune a lot of hyperparameters. Um, this is very, this one is very out of the box compared to, uh, to the other ones. Um, so I always recommend uh, starting our models or our experiments with algorithms like this one, since they are very, very good and very easy to use too. Um, so again, I won't go into too much detail about this, but basically a random forest is an ensemble of many decision trees. Um, and a decision tree is, is some sort of simple uh, classification algorithm in itself uh, that kind of works like this. So in this example here, let's say we have two classes that we want to predict, a zero or a one. Um, our input data has uh, two features, let's say color and underline. So that's the input data. And for each feature, we need to separate, we separate our data into uh, the categories. And if one of the remaining classes, as in our blue class here in the example, can be divided or has a proportion of classes that it's too, um, it's too one-sided, then uh, we use metrics to determine that. Then that branch of the decision tree ends there. And if it can be divided uh, in, in a, in a more, more or less uh, balanced way. Uh, we divide it again and so on until we make more divisions. So there, there's a whole um, heuristic to determine uh, how to divide or how to, uh, which, which feature to divide um, each uh, example at any time. Uh, but yeah, we won't go into too much detail about that. But in the end, uh, what a 
what a random forest is, is just a collection of these trees. Uh, they have different structures because they are taken from uh, different subsets of the data. And we also uh, take out some columns uh, from our different trees so that uh, we end up with a, a slightly different trees. And then uh, we say, let's say we have a hundred of, of these trees and we make predictions using all of them and the winner the winning prediction is uh, what would be our final prediction. Um, so if you want to learn more, uh, there's a link right here too. So hope we can, you can all see it. Um, okay. So coming back to the, to the competition. Um, so our training, uh, our training example uh, to actually train our model needs to have a follow a certain format uh, or a recommended format. So let's say that we take a pair of user IDs from our training set, and then uh, for each of these user IDs, we take all the attributes uh, we're going to use and group them into one vector. And then we concatenate these two user attributes vectors into one final input vector that we'll call X. And then our target value is just the score between these two users. So in this example, for example, uh, these two users matched. So our target value Y uh, would be one. Um, so we train our model with thousands of these examples uh, so that we end with a model able to make predictions on the test data, which is, uh, consists on pairs of user IDs. So let's uh, it, well, let's see if people have uh, questions now before jumping into the code. We'll have the recording available afterwards and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Gaurav is asking, are we going to use all of the data given in the zip file to train the model? Uh, the answer would be not necessarily. So what, what we wanted to do with this competition is to make it as real as possible. So we want uh, participants to determine what data is useful and what data is not that useful. So we want, uh, our idea is that users, I mean participants, can incrementally test uh, more data to determine what uh, is actually useful or has any predictive value uh, for the problem at hand. Hey guys, um, hope um, you have already downloaded. Oh, there's a question there, answer live. Uh, you said you concatenated the two user data and assigned the score. Is it a part of training set? Yes. Um, so we'll take a look now at the, at the training data and some other files. And uh, you'll see that we have a, our training file is basically a pair of user IDs that we need to, and with those user IDs, we need to grab the data from the users that we want to use. And the score is also part of the training file. So we have a we have a score that we can use 
the trainer model and we have the user IDs and we have the user data itself. So how we use it, that's what we're gonna see now, okay? We also have a few questions in the chat. Um, I'll just mark these as down. So uh, Fong is asking, you mentioned about random forest. Is it just your choice or do we also have to use random forest? Oh, uh, no, it, no, I mean, that's just my choice. Um, I'm going to do the following part using a random forest because I think it's a very easy to use. Uh, it's quite easy to understand too. And it's very powerful. So yeah, but you can, uh, if you want to go on your own, you can do something like um, uh, gradient boosting or something like that. And then Jason is asking why concentrate on the user IDs? I mean, I think that's just a, a reference point, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, um, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a reference point. So the user IDs are not a uh, part of the input data. They are just to have a connection point to the other data files, as we will see now. Okay. Uh, and then Naveen was asking some follow-up questions. Um, why not cosine distance? Cosine distance. Uh, what What do you mean? All right. We'll just wait for him to respond in the Q and A section. Um, so if Naveen, you could share some more information about cosine distance, that would be great. Um, and also, if anybody else has questions, if you can add it in the Q&A tab, um, it should be an option at the bottom of your Zoom window, um, just so we can kind of keep track um, and see which ones we've answered so far. Uh, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so now, uh, now we're going to take a look at the data. And maybe we, you will uh, be able to answer um, some other questions. So um, if you have it installed, please um, try to open your Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook. Um, so for example, if you have your data downloaded in a folder, uh, you can go uh, in the terminal to that or any way that you open your Jupyter Lab. And open the Jupyter lab there. I'm not gonna run this command because I already have it open, but well, you should open the Jupyter lab in your, in the folder that you extracted the data. So we will get to, uh, so you will see something like this. Um, so one point is people are asking if we can zoom in on the font because it's kind of difficult to see. On this one? Yeah, is that possible? You can do, um, pres oh, presentation mode. I'll try to, um, maybe this seems to be. Okay. Let me see what I can do. Um, All right, so while he's working on that, um, Naveen is mentioning, he's following up on his previous question. Um, since the data are vector, wouldn't multiplying the vectors of two users give a score? With that score, can't we assign a threshold? Since the data are vector, we multiplying the vectors of two users give a score. And the score can we assign a threshold? Yes, I'm not sure. Um, I think, yeah, I think I know what you're trying to say, but the thing is, um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'm actually, responding correctly to your question, but um, the thing here is that it, we don't know if these um, users have to be similar or not. So let's say that we have two similar users with similar characteristics, and that uh, multiplication of vectors or that mat mathematical operations would give us a score based on the distance of those um, vectors of uh, user vectors. But we also want to, uh, for example, two users could be very compatible if they are very different. So uh, we want, to, you could apply some algorithm like that to get some sort of score, but uh, we think uh, 
machine learning algorithm, a normal machine learning algorithm would be more flexible and, and maybe easier. I hope I'm answering your question. Thank you, Jorge. Okay, so uh, I hope you could uh, all um, open your Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, and then you have already downloaded the data. So once you extract the data, we can create a new notebook inside that folder. Um, like this. So is this too small? Mm. I don't know if I can, oh, I can increase the terminal. Mm. Increase code on size. Maybe. Is this big enough? Try increase the size more. What was this? Hey guys, um, so I hope you all open your Jupyter lab or notebook and you're in this folder and you created a new notebook. So the first thing that we'll do is uh, import the pandas library, which is a very important and powerful library for data science and data analysis. Um, with it, we can do a lot of data visualization and data processing. So it is important to understand how to use pandas uh, if you want to work with Python. And if you're not familiar with it, um, don't worry since we're not going to use, do anything too complicated. Um, and we will share some a few resources later uh, where you can learn more, but uh, the internet is absolutely filled with uh, content and tutorials on how to use pandas. So it should be easy to catch up. Um, if you don't have pandas installed, you can install it right now uh, running this in a new cell. Um, so since I, I have it already installed, it shows up, but it should look different if you don't have it installed. And we will also be using a machine learning library called um, scikit-learn, which is another very popular and complete library for machine learning and data science. And again, if you don't have it installed, you can install it like this. Um, by the way, uh, one of the, the wagon guys mm -hmm. is mentioning if you do um, this shortcut, it should be able to make the text a little bit bigger. Come on, plus. Okay. Let me turn. Oh. Oh yeah. There we go. That's nice. I hope that's good enough. Yeah, let us know if that text size is big enough or if any if anyone's still having issues reading it, let us know. Okay. They're saying nope, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, that's great. Um okay, so um okay, so we can we can start now. Um, so I, I like to, uh, I like to use titles and markdown in my notebook. So everything is more clean and organized. So let's now create a section, uh, with this, you can make a title, uh, that we call read data. Um, okay. So it's very important to understand and do some data visualizations of your data. 
uh, before anything else. So you know what you're dealing with. Uh, so here we see that uh, we have a lot of different files, uh, like user files, um, we have interaction files, and then we have the train and test files. So let's take a look first at the train, how the train file looks like. So, so to do that, we use the read CSV command. Uh, I mean, pandas method that reads comma separated values. So read that file. With a shift enter, we can. Oh, I have an file here. Yeah, so now I have imported pandas. And um, so let's now take a look at it again. So the head command uh, allows us to take a quick look at the data. Um, so we see that we have these pairs of IDs, user IDs, uh, along with a score. So the first, um, this first one means that these two users uh, did not match. The second one means that these two users matched, for example. Um, we're getting some requests uh, just to wait a little while until the data sets have been downloaded. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Um, I'll just answer a few questions in the chat in the meantime. Sure, no problem. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll take just like a quick couple minute break. Okay. Um, yeah, while you, you guys bathroom. are downloading. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> little bathroom break. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mohammed is asking, uh, will the notebook be shared with us after the webinar? Sure, sure. Yeah, I can show the I can share the, okay. the notebook. Don't worry. Uh, we're getting quite a few questions. I'm trying to keep track of them all. Okay, let me take a look. Um, again, if you all don't mind um, asking the questions in the Q and A panel, uh, just so we can keep track of that, so that would be a big help for us. Mm. Chat. Yes, to the people asking, um, we are going to share the notebook. Yes, we will, um, for sure. If we can share any drive link available. Oh, unfortunately, we, unfortunately, we don't have it in Drive. Yeah, the data set itself, um, because we you have to agree to the NDA to download it off of our mm. off, off of our platform. Um, we don't have a zipped version or a drive file for that. Yeah, I'm. So, we're sorry that the the data is um, quite big. Mm. And we've also gotten a couple of questions about a recording. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, there will be a recording of this after um, after today's session. So we'll be sharing that on our, our on our channels. For us, I think it'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, so mm -hmm. we'll be sharing a link with that afterwards. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so uh, Barun Sakuni asked, um, should we use traditional machine learning approach or deep learning approach if data set is large in any competition? Um, 
that's a that's a good question um but it depends on the more than the size of your data it depends on the shape uh, the type of data you have um if you have a lot of training examples in, in our case we have a it's a 600 megabytes file um zip file but we have different types of uh, files uh, with different types of data and maybe we'll see uh we don't have that many training examples in the end so uh you could use uh deep learning but maybe the, the thing i always recommend is to start with um, more traditional or simpler easy to implement machine learning algorithms because uh even though deep learning can give you can give you an edge um when you're trying to actually get to a very 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 high score uh you can achieve a pretty pretty good score with using uh, much simpler algorithms so it depends on the data if you, if you don't have a huge amount of data like millions of uh training examples uh maybe it's not you're not gonna get that much uh, an improvement but if you know how to use deep learning well and uh, then that that could be a good um a good idea but i always recommend to start uh, with a simple algorithm but because you a deep learning algorithm you have to tune it you have to choose for example number of layers you have to um choose the size of these layers uh, some, and some many other hyperparameters that are actually second secondary to uh, understanding and having your data used like in a in a form that you can use it so uh, as i always say um like 80 percent or more of the of data scientists job is uh, data processing and data preparing the data doing feature engineering and they actually creating the model and that stuff it can be 20 percent so i hope that i answered your question with that your training data is score but you mentioned about class how can you see these classes using score yeah i think that's a that's a problem on our side we I, we use the we use the term score uh, but it's actually more of a classification problem i guess you can you can look at it as a as a score like three should could be more than two and two could be more than one because it's it's some sort of uh, score of com compatibility but it's not it's not exactly like lineal or uh or something like that so in the end it's basically it's better to treat it as a classification problem uh which with four classes which are zero one two three instead of a a score that you could treat uh treat it with a regression algorithm for example so yeah that's that's a problem on our our term we use the term score but it, it should have been in the same class actually good question we have a few more Q and A's in the tab. Um, I mean, we, we should probably just limit it to one for now, for time mm -hmm. purposes, right? Okay, yeah, we, we need to continue. Um, so one of them seems kind of like an administrative question about where to put the data set. Um, so Duana said she's new to Jupyter Lab. I have to run it, run on Anaconda. Which folder should I put the data set into? That seems like it's a necessary. Yeah. Um, so you can. You can put it anywhere that you want because you can uh, run any like Python commands from anywhere in your computer um, in general. Uh, you can put it the data whenever, whenever, wherever it accommodates you. And you should try to create the notebook uh, maybe inside the data folder, or you can create it um, one level, like one folder, like outside the folder, the data folder. But you can put it anywhere, the data, okay. wherever it's, it works best for you. Cool. All right, we're, we're gonna put questions on hold for now um, so we can move on, but uh, I'll be paying attention to this. And if anybody has any other urgent questions, yeah. just let us know. Yeah, so let's, let's we have to continue. Um, so yeah, um, so I also, as I was saying, uh, let's take a look at the train data here. Um, I mean, our chain file actually. Um, so it looks like this. We have this score, which uh, is actually a class um, representing the compatibility of these users. And 
So yeah, this one means that they didn't match. This one means that they match. And this one means that they match and met. And this user gave this one a good review. Um, OK, and so on. Um, OK, so this is the file that we need to, to base on to create our training data. This is not the training data by itself, because this is just a bunch of IDs. But this is our guide to create the training data. Um, and so now let's take a look at the test data. How does the test data look like? Do the same. Um, take a look at it with the head command. Okay, so as you can see, these are only pairs of IDs um, that have to be predicted using the, the model that we train. So we're going to train a model using this. Uh, I mean, the data that we gather from these IDs. Um, then we need to do the same data processing to gather the attributes of these users and predict their level of compatibility for the class. So this, is, this isn't really a test, um, like a test file. It's more of a prediction uh, file, right? Like prediction indexes. Um, so yeah, so now let's take a quick look at some of the other files. Um, so we have user ages, we have uh, educations, we have uh, purposes to join the app. So now let's take a quick look at the uh, one of the simple files, which is the user ages. So um, as you can see, we have one row for each user uh, and its corresponding age. Uh, we, see, we can see here that we have a user zero that appears to be four years old. So this is most likely not true. Um, so we can assume that this user ID zero uh, must have been some sort of test user. Uh, so we can get rid of it later, but for now, let's just ignore it. Um, now, but let's let's better take a look at the at the distribution of these ages. So we can easily do that with the with the hist method of pandas. Um, which stands for histogram. So we select uh, only the column, the H column here, and we apply the method. Hist, and we can choose to group the data into, let's say, 30 bins here. Oops. All right, this is H. Okay. So, um, as, we, as we can see, uh, most of the users uh, are between 20 and 40 years old, and some smaller portion of them are older than 40. Um, we can see here that this plot. Um, gets goes up to 120, uh, which means that we have some outlier users who might be around 120 years old. So that, of course, is quite unlikely to. So if you want to improve our model, uh, we can later try to remove these users uh, that are outliers, like this one and this one. Uh, but let's just ignore them for now. Uh, let's take a look at another file like the user uh, purposes which are the purpose of, like the reason why these users join the agent app. Okay, so this file shows the different IDs of these reasons. Uh, uh, the reasons I, each user indicated as to why they joined Yenta. Um, so now let's take a look at which are the most popular reasons of this uh, within our data. So to do that, we need to sum. Um, we need to sum over the data, and then add them into a bar plot. Uh, we can do this using the plot method. 
and setting the argument uh, kind to bar. So if we do this, oh, so if we do this, we see that uh, we get user ID a huge number. And that is because user ID is also a number, but it's just an ID. So it, it, it's uh, making a mess of our data. So we need to get rid of the user ID because those are just IDs. And to do that, we have to add here drop user ID. So it, it ignores this column. And we need to set this key axis to one because um, because this indicates that we are operating on columns. So we are getting rid of this column because zero would indicate that this operation is on rows, right? So if we run this now, we get the actual, a better sense of um, the frequency of each of these reasons. So we can see that, uh, for example, in the most popular reason is uh, ID one that can be, we don't know, but can be something like, I want to do networking. Uh, and the less popular one is uh, number 11, which can be something like, I don't know, I want to uh, get a mentor or something. This is just, just a hypothesis. We don't really know what they mean, but it, it should be something along those lines. Um, okay, so, Finally, let's take a look at the uh, one of the vectorized um, date, text data files, like the user's uh, self introductions, which are the, the biographies. So there's a cool trick here. If you press the top uh, button, you can get the this and select it quicker. So this takes a bit longer because it's bigger. And okay, so this is how it looks like. We can see that um, the number of characters, we, we have the number of characters on the original self-introduction. Uh, we have the number of URLs on that self-introduction. And we have the number of emojis. And then we have here uh, 300 columns, which represent, each one represents one coordinate in the 300 dimension space that we chose to represent this text. So as we discussed, um, similar vectors here um, indicate similar texts or so similar biographies. Um, and very different vectors would indicate very different biographies, right? So we could, I mean, we could try to plot this data, but I don't think there will be anything too interesting uh, for now. So, uh, Let's just keep going. Okay, so are there some questions for now, maybe, that we could answer? Um, how uh, are we doing on time, do you think? I don't know. Um, it's, more, it's like 8, 10 right now. Okay, so let's just ask, I'll answer one or two questions. One or two questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, So Garab asked, we will be using random forest algorithm, right? Um, yes, yeah, so we will, um, yeah, we'll be using here the random forest algorithm, mm -hmm. um, but you can use the, uh, whichever you want, but if you want to get the same or a similar answer uh, than we're having here, you should use that one. Uh, we won't do hyperparameter tuning uh, because we won't have too much time for that. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that a bit, a little bit later. Object oriented data. Mm. What about Hiroto's question? Yeah. For example, shall we just do read to all data frames and see data to figure out? Or you can I think that's like a follow up from something else. Relationships tables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Hiroto is asking. Uh, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. um, one of the lagging people already answered. We're good on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so many intros. Why so many intros? Because we have uh, 
I mean, you mean so many columns, right? Because we're choosing to represent our data, uh, our text data with 300 dimensions. So in theory, the more, the more dimensions you have to represent your text data, the more uh, like accurately you can represent the semantic value of, of your text or, or, or words. So if you choose, if, you, if we have chosen to represent it with only three dimensions, that is uh, three columns, then we wouldn't be able to um, represent some complex uh, things that are, are going on in the text. For example, we could say that one of these columns represents the intensity of the message. For example, if one person is very aggressive, uh, let's say this, this one, let's say this person is very aggressive into how they write, their biography, and this one is quite much softer. So that's one in many dimensions that you could, um, let's say, analyze the or represent the text data. Uh, of course, we don't have control on, on how which what each of these columns represent. Uh, that's just the algorithm chooses uh, what each one would represent. So. But the more columns we have, the better for, in general, for our machine learning algorithm. Of course, if we've had too many of them, then we run into some other issues. But we think that 300 is a, a good number for this case. Great, great. Okay, let's uh, keep, keep going. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so uh, we need to create now the training examples. So. Uh, if you remember, what we, we need to do is to put together two user attributes into one row to create our training example. So let's create a new section um, called create examples. Um, okay. so, so we can try to create our first model now. So our first model will be very, very simple. We will try to predict the compatibility of two users only using their age. Um, of course, this is not a great model probably, but it's just a starting point. Um, so first we need to create our actual training samples uh, since we can't use the data directly as it is right here. So to do that, we need to separate um, these pairs of IDs first. Um, so we can match them with their attributes. So one, we, one easy way to do that is uh, as follows. So we will create two new columns uh, in the same data frame called from and to. Um, and to create them, we use the string split method. Um, so what this method does is uh, allows us to use Python methods. The, the str extension allows us to use string methods over each value of a column. So it, it would apply this method to each of these uh, IDs, which are strings. So what it does is that it um, splits uh, the data into different elements uh, using the separator that we indicate. So we have that separator. And this will return an array of two elements containing the elements that uh, were separated by, by that character. And, and then we want to use this argument expand so that each of these new elements in this array that we're going to get gets uh, a new column. So well, after that, we simply use, we can use this other method called as type that will convert all the returning values into integers because these are strings, that is a text, and we want to have them as numbers because uh, the rest of the data are numbers. So let's see how this turns out. Okay. So you see now we have two columns uh, with the user IDs. Uh, for the, that we can use to grab the data from each user and put it into one row. So to do that, let's first um, create a copy 
of our data frame so that we can run experiments and we don't lose track of this train uh, variable. Um, so what this function does is it just creates a copy of the data frame to a new data frame. Um, if we don't use copy here and just sign it by itself like, like this, um, then any modification that we do to X would modify train two and that's not what we want to have to know. So we have to use copy. Um, okay, now what we want to do is join our different tables, okay? So using the user IDs. So we want to replace these user IDs uh, with this user's attributes. So we, we don't want to use the IDs, we want to use uh, the attributes that we chose uh, to represent this user with, right? So to do that, we need to first, um, so we uh, update X, we first need to set as index um, the columns that we want to use to connect these data frames. So they will be from, and then we use the method join, and we connect the user pages. Okay, so what the set index does is, as it says, it changes the index of the table to the column that, you, that we indicate, okay? So for example, our current X uh, looks like this, but if we set the index to from, it will look like this. So it, it, it takes the, the from column and uses an index. And when, when we have the from, or this user IDs as index, then we can use the join to actually get from this index, get its attributes and merge these files. So we'll see how this turns out. Um, okay. And we need to do that for the from user ID and also for the to user ID. Okay, um, so at the end here, uh, we actually need to specify um, some suffix of the columns that we will be repeated. So since we are going to join two, um, two data frames with the column name H, uh, we need to have uh, some sort of way to differentiate them. So we'll use this, so X would be from user and she would be the why we need a user. So let's take a look at how this looks like. Okay. okay, so we end up with this data frame that has um, the ID, the score, um, and the attributes that we're going to use for this initial model, which is just the age of these two users. Um, okay, so but before feeding this data to the model, we need to handle the null values. So let's see if we have um, how many. So to do that, we can use the is null method of uh, data frames. And we can sum over all the columns because is null uh, works for, shows if, if we have any null value in each row. And if we sum, we can get the total number of nulls. So if we run this, we see that we have uh, 3,000 and 5,000, which isn't that much. So we can get rid of them. Um, we can, for example, get rid of any row that has, has at least one null age value. So there are, other, there are other ways that we can handle this, uh, but this is a very simple one. So let's go with that one for now. So to, do, to drop all the the rows that have null values, we can use this method here called drop in A. And this will drop the null values, right? So it's important to, uh, before feeding any type of input data to a machine learning model, you need to do something with the null values. You, you need to handle them. So, um, okay, so, um, now we want to uh, place our targets 
or score into a unique variable that we will call y. Um, so we can use it in our train the trainer model. To do that, uh, we select only the score column. So we save it here. And after we do that, we can get rid of the scores uh, from our input data frame. And to do that, we can run this. So again, we drop the column. We have to specify the access to one because we are operating on columns here. And we also don't want to use the IDs as input data, but we want to have them somewhere to keep track of each row, what each row represents. So we can set the index uh, of our data frame to be this uh, from two IDs. Okay. So, well, let's see how this looks like. Okay. So as you see, now we have um, only the ages for both of these users. So this is a very, very, very simple model. Uh, that, but it should be enough to just like run a few experiments. Um, so let's now create a, a model that will be trained using this age. So let's create a new section that we will call create model. Okay. Um, and we can create a subsection here that would be called um, H only to specify that we are only using H in this model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe you can have a answer one or two questions for the evening or we should just go. Um, we have like 40, a little less than 40 minutes left. Um, I'm okay to just keep going. Okay. Get our first submission. Yeah, I hope uh, you guys are following along. Um, I'll upload the, we'll put the notebook up later so you can take a look at the details. Um, maybe you did have one question. Sorry, why indexing in the new data frame? Why indexing in the new data frame? This one? Maybe? Maybe. Um, we index here just to, because we can't use the, these IDs as, um, as input data, because they are IDs. Mm -hmm. But having them as index allows us to uh, have our data organized. So if we, if, we, if we had dropped these IDs, we would not know uh, which one of these, um, what these edges represent. I mean, we know what they represent, but we don't know which user uh, they belong to. Right, so it's really not that necessary. We can still train our model without using this as uh, as the index, but it's it's good for uh, having keep keeping things organized. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so to create our model, we first need to import the methods that we're going to use from Scikit-Learn. Um, the first that the first one that we're going to use is called um, it's called train test split, which basically allows us to randomly split our data into a train set and a test set according to the percentage we assign. And the second one um, that we need to import is the is the random forest classifier class um, to create a random forest model. I mean, function, yeah, no, it's class. Um, so since this is a classification problem, we import the classifier here uh, because there's also a regressor. There's a random forest regressor for problems that are regression problems, which are the ones that you want to predict a number. Um, so then we split our data. Um, and 
So this is our input data, this is our labels, and mm -hmm. and we set this here. Okay, so note, note first that um, we already have a test file here, uh, but that isn't really a test file that can be used to evaluate our models. So since it does not contain any labels, so because that file is for creating our predictions later. So what we need to do is to split our train data again into a strain and a test. So we can have a test of our own within our, tra our, our train data. So to do that, we use this function right here. Um, we pass it our input data, our labels, um, for target data and the percentage of the data that we want to use as test for our uh, evaluation. And then we use this parameter here called random state. So it, it's good practice to use functions that work with random generators by passing them a, a random state or, or a seed so that if we repeat the experiment um, with the exact same data, we get the same result. And so that whatever I run, sh you should get the same, I think. Um, so it, it can be any number. I just chose to use this one for whatever reason. Um, and so what this, this function outputs is um, a new smaller input train data, uh, smaller test input uh, test data. Um, and the labels of um, our new train and new um, test data frames. So if we run that, we get that. Um, so this, this, and this also just, uh, this also shuffles our data. So it's very good because we need to, um, we need to have our data in a random order because otherwise we could run into uh, the, the order of our data could be encoding something and we want to always train our model with a, with a shuffle of, of the data. Okay. So then we can go to create, create our model. Um, so we create it this way. Um, And we can choose another random state. We can choose anything. Let's just use the same number. And, and I always use this uh, verbose parameter, which indicates uh, some sort of the level of, like the amount of information that this method outputs. Uh, so it prints here. So what's going on in the training process. Um, so we can run this. Okay. And finally, we can, so we won't do any hyperparameter tuning here. You can, actually, you can select the number of trees that you want to have. Uh, so the default, the default value is 100. So we can, we can change this, but we won't do it. We just, we'll just try with the default value to see what we get. So yeah, we create a model. And and finally, we can train our model um, using the fit method, right? So we pass here our new training data, I mean training input, and our new training labels. So if we run this, our model will start training. Okay. Um, so it shouldn't take too long to build the 100 trees, uh, which is the default for this plus fire. Um, it could take longer depending on your computer, but it shouldn't be that much. Um, okay. I hope everyone is following along. Let's wait until it's finished.
Wow, building trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody mentioned in the chat, wow, building trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's, it, it finished um, training our, our model with the data already passed. So it didn't take too long because we're using just two features. And after it's finished, we can evaluate our model accuracy under test data um, using the score function. So uh, this, uses, this gets, uh, outputs the accuracy. So the accuracy is just a rate of correct answers. And, and remember that we need to always remember we need to evaluate our model using data that it has never seen before. So we use our train data here and we score it using the test data. We can't pass it the train data, otherwise uh, that would be like cheating because the model already saw the correct answers. So this is totally new data. Uh, that we know the answers, so we'll see what we get. And now it's predicting. Okay, <laughs> so we got our first result. Um, okay, this is not very good. Uh, if we consider that if we put all the labels to zero, we should get something like 50% accuracy. So, well, at least this is slightly better than, than, better than random. So random would be 50. And so we can say that H has some slightly prediction power, uh, like the H's by themselves. Um, okay, but that, that was a very simple model. So now let's try to create a, a model using slightly more data, a slightly more interesting model. Um, okay, so we can do, we can create a new section here. Uh, let's try to use the proposed data, which are here the reasons um, to why people joined the app. It's only 15 uh, columns, so it shouldn't be that hard. And we expect that this has some prediction power because uh, maybe people with same uh, proposed or uh, I don't know compatible proposed would be compatible in general, right? So we create a new section here. And we can just repeat the process in general. So uh, let's create, let's assign X to be a new copy of our train model in our train data. Um, but we can just basically copy these to join the the training data to to our our files or variables that we're going to use, but in this case we are not going to join it with just the user eight. We are going to pass it an array consisting of the user ages and the user purposes. So using the same uh, from ID, we want to get from this. Uh, user ID, we want to get the ages and the purposes. So we also have to assign the index to the user ID. And that's it. And this is an array. We have to do the same thing. So we can just copy paste and cheat it here. And we do the same thing with the suffix here so that uh, any repeated column name um, can be distinguished from each other. So if we do that, we can take a look at how this looks like. Oh, okay. Um, so as you see, we have um, the from two ID here. Uh, we have the score, and then we have the age and the purposes. So X would be the first user, and Y would be the second user. So it's not showing all the columns, but uh, we can see here which columns do we have. So we have uh, the age and the purposes of the first user and the age and the purposes of the second user. And we have the score and the index. So again, we have to check the new values. Um, 
And we see that we see that we have uh, quite a lot more here. So because like if if we assume that um, most people that do not fill out the proposed form uh, wouldn't care that much or don't have that proposed. So what we can do here is instead of dropping um, these null values, which are a lot, you can just assume that um, they can re be represented with a zero. So if we don't have information, what we can do is instead of dropping these null, null values, we can fill them with a zero representing that users did not choose that option. So there are, of course, other ways to handle this. Uh, we could try to think of a more appropriate way. But for now, uh, this should suffice. So we do it like this. So this will uh, fill all the null values here with zeros. And we also, again, have to get our target variable here. Same way that we did it before. And this, okay. And again, we need to uh, get rid of the of the score here because that's part of the labels. Again, uh, we specify x is equal one because this is a column. And we again, for convenience, set the index to the from two IDs. Okay, so now let's finally take a look at how this ends up. Okay, so we have a data frame uh, with 32 columns, uh, which the edges and the purposes. Okay, great. So this should have uh, some better prediction power. So yeah, we assume that pe people's purposes would indicate, uh, would be, I guess, a better predictor of um, interest to other people than just the age. So, do you want to upload it to the platform? Hmm? Do you want to upload it to the platform just so they can see how to do that? Oh, but just yeah, we need to create the this. Let's me try. Let me train this model, and then we're going oh, to because okay. I need to create the predictions. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think um, we have to see how this model turns out, and if it turns out good enough, maybe you can make our first submission. Um, so again, we'll just copy this to split our data uh, randomly. We copy paste here because it's just basically the same. Um, we run this. And now we can create, update our model to be another, uh, again, a random forest classifier. Estimators. Let's leave it at 100 and the random state. Let's use the same number just for convenience. And verbose to be two. So if I set, for example, verbose to zero uh, and I run the fit method, I wouldn't see any output. So I would just like to, I would have to wait until it's finished, but I wouldn't know when it's going to finish. Um, okay, so we create the new model. And we can fit it now. So again, we use our train data and our train labels here, and we can train it. Okay. So naturally, since we're using a lot more columns, this uh, is going to take longer to train. It's building the trees, the decision trees. Um, so yeah, maybe we can answer a couple of questions. Uh, sure, let me take a look. There was a question about user bios. Mm -hmm. um, since every user bio must be different, um, that's the reason why probabilities can be closer or not, but they can't be equal ones. No, there can't be, I mean, unless two people have this exact same bio. They like copied and pasted it. Yeah, like and that's bio. like, if we're talking about real life, that's possible. Some people maybe created two profiles. Like, hi, I'm a data scientist. Yeah, <laughs> like data scientists from India. And yeah. then some other people have the same bio. So it's not impossible, 
but yeah. Okay, so I hope you guys are following along. Um, there was also a question about hyperparameter tuning. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Will you be guiding us how to do that too? No, sorry. In this uh, in this tutorial this time, I'm not going to go through hyperparameter tuning. Um, since I want I want to just uh, so this this competition in general is has a lot of data and a lot of ways that you can use the data. So I think it's a better approach uh, at first with this competition to try to figure out what data can be used. Mm -hmm. And once you uh, like check some of these data files and find a way that you can get a decent score using a, just a like vanilla algorithm, just like without any hyperparameter tuning, uh, then you can start uh, worrying about that, I would say. I would say that's the best approach because we still have a lot of data files and maybe maybe you will go to through a lot of tuning and even if we still have data files that could increase our accuracy like much faster but yeah that's something that we can go through in another webinar sorry that we don't have time for that today right. okay so question. my computer finished um i don't know if some some of you guys, if you're running this uh, finished, oh. let's wait, wait like one minute more to see if. Um, yeah, I think some people are still tree building. Mm -hmm. Planting trees, yeah. <laughs> Saving the planet. Okay, so this is gonna answer one question. Um, so Hiroto asked, what, what are the merits of using the join method instead of merge? Uh, so they do basically almost the same thing. So join works with indexes. So if you want to join, like if, if we are talking about the um, SQL language, uh, if, you, if you want to join two tables uh, just via the index then you use join but if you want to specify uh, the column that you want to join these uh, tables you need to use merge so merge um you need to join i mean use merge to join tables at a specific point right so in our case uh it's simpler to just set an index to join oh and also in our case for example uh given that we have um Oh, it's around here. Yeah. So given that we have um, this index, I mean, this user ID is called from, and this user ID is called user ID. Um, if we use merge, we would have to specify that the left join, I mean, the left table uh, is called from, and then the right table it's called user ID. So it's it's basically the same, but it's it makes it it makes things cleaner to use join in this case. But it's, there's really no, um, no any preference. So merge is used for, uh, to specify the column that you want to do the join and join is just for uh, joining with IDs. I hope I answered your question. 
Okay, so since we don't have that much time, let's try to now let's try to evaluate our model. Let's see uh, how much accuracy we get uh, with this, our new slightly bigger um, data model. So to do that, we again use our test input data, our test labels, and we run this. Okay, so great. Uh, we got an increase in about 10% um, compared to just using the H. So this is still not uh, like a big, um, like a very good accuracy, um, but it's still, we had, we had a slightly uh, decent increase in our accuracy just by using the purposes, right? So, Okay, so maybe we can just uh, create our first submission here um, to the and upload it to the platform. Okay, so but first we need to create predictions using this model. Um, so to do that, we have to okay, let's create a section here called make predictions. Okay. Um, so to, we need to actually do the exact same um, data processing that we did to the train file, uh, but to our test file. So, because if you remember, this is uh, just a bunch of IDs. So we need to extract the IDs and get the user attributes. So we can just copy um, that. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, it's only here. So we can, to do that, you can uh, click here and you can shift up to the point where you want to, we want to do this, it'd be around here. And then you, you click on C, the, the character C on your keyboard and that we copy all those cells. And we click here and we press V so that would paste all the cells that we copy. Um, I hope everyone could um, <laughs> do that. Just grabbing here, then shift to select more than one. And remember, and then you click on C, uh, just the C, and then you click, click on B um, to paste all the cells. Um, okay. So it's, but it's mostly the same thing. So, but instead we need to replace here. Um, the, oh, but we, I forgot one thing. So yeah, we, we need to first split the data too. So I also need to copy this part, right? So I click again, I click here, click C. And, and I put it here. And so if I, press V here, it's gonna paste it uh, like on the bottom of this uh, title. Okay, so now we have to do the same, but using the test file, okay? So can replace this and uh, we can run that. Okay, so now we have uh, user ID split and we can do the same data processing. So I will come and call X test, uh, copy of the test. And we do the same, same thing here. We don't even need to replace anything because this is working on the X. So we run this. Okay, so the only difference here is that we don't have the score, right? So because we had here, the, this is our input data, um, we had the, the score, but we don't have score here because these are the ideas that we need to predict. So then we check again for null values. Okay, we have a similar proportion. And we do again, the, we fill the null values with zeros and extract the 
target. Oh no, but we don't have our target here. So we just failed. Um, yeah, since we don't have a score, because these are the predict prediction um, IDs, we remove this part and we only set the index to from two. Now uh, let's see how this looks like. Okay. I hope I didn't lose you there. Um, I know I did a lot of things and copied and paste, uh, but this is just basically copying the same process that we did for the train. Um, but we did it on the test and we skipped the parts where we are working with the score. So now we have a data frame, uh, an input data frame, which consists of the age and the purposes, just like in our previous um, part. So now, uh, now we can actually create the predictions using our model. So the model that we have now, this one, um, was trained using ages and purposes. So we can create predictions of this new, um, these this new user attributes using the method predict. Okay. So this will just, um, okay, and then we can already like assign it immediately. Uh, we create a column called score. Because if you remember the test only has some, um, okay, we have this ID, it's just an ID. So we will create a new column called score and that will be a series of this. So predictions, I think it outputs uh, an array and we want, the, a series is a fancy name for a column So in pandas. So this will take our array and we'll create a new column that we will put uh, on the test data frame. So we can now run this. Again, in the predictions. Okay. So now we can get rid of the of the from and because if you remember, we have the from and to, and we don't need those for the submission file. Um, so we drop them. So to drop more than one column at the same time, you need to put them in an array like this. Okay. And again, as always, you have to specify the access to one because we are working with columns here. And again, set the index to from two. Okay. So we do that. We get uh, our IDs and the scores. Okay. So these are all predictions. We have 300, uh, almost 400,000 predictions uh, based on the test file. Okay. So now we're ready to put this into a file and upload it to the platform. So to do that, we use the function to CSV. And here we put the name of the file that we want to use. So let's just call it submission.csv. And, and we have to, I mean, yeah, in this case, we have to use uh, this parameter called index equals false. No, no, I think, I think we don't have to. Yeah, because this already is the index. Okay, yeah, so we think we have to, we can just run this. And this will create a new file here called submission. So this submission has, uh, has the exact same IDs that the test, uh, but it has an extra column with the predictions that we made using our model, our ages and purposes only model, okay? So now we are ready to submit that file to the platform. Um, okay, so we can go to the competition page and there's a button uh, in here in the upper corner that's called new submission. So if you click on here, um, you can upload your CSV file, right? So we click here. 
And yeah, so we have this, yeah, we have the rest of the data and this is our submission. So I, I'm not going to upload it because that would be, I was one of the creators of this competition, so that would be like cheating. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> so, but here you can upload it if you want. Um, yeah, you, you sh then you have to put some sort of description here. So let's say whatever, first submission. And then you click on submit. And then you, you can submit um, three times a day, right? Um, okay, so I'm not going to do it. I'm just gonna wait uh, like one or two minutes for people to do it. Um, after you submit it, you will you have to wait a couple seconds or maybe a minute or two. And you will see somewhere, I'm not, I don't remember exactly where, uh, but you can see your submission. And um, yeah, you can see what score did you get. So if your predict the predictions that we made are good enough or not, uh, or if we get the same, because we train, I mean, we, we evaluated this using um here so this we made a new evaluation of our model using a subset of the train data but the test data here uh so there are we have the 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 solution file we have the correct answers so it, it could it could it should be similar to to this value inaccuracy but we don't know so so i hope you guys could submit it and maybe you can see already what accuracy did you get. Awesome. Thank you, Jorge. So um, we have a few other questions. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of getting close to our end time of 9 p.m. JST here. Okay. Um, but I'd like to ask, answer a couple more questions before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, so one question was, what range would you classify as good accu accuracy for one of these competitions? Oh, it, it all depends on the, on the competition itself. So as you can see here, um, so this, is a, this competition has now uh, 1,300 people. And this only shows the top 25, but you can see that the, there's some guys that has 70 something here and they're on the top. So some competitions, um, it depends on the data. So this data is of course harder to get some high level accuracy because, um, well, it, it may be not as good as uh, in quality as data as some other um, type of problems. For example, in class, image classification problems, uh, where you have thousands of training, I mean, or millions of training examples, uh, then people usually can get to 90 something. But the thing is, this particular competition is based on a real problem uh, from a real company. And it's very, it's, it's just a company that took their database, we put it in a competition, and we're trying to figure out what's the best accuracy that we can get. So uh, in our particular case, uh, so these guys are all approaching 80 something. So in this competition, I don't think 63 is very good, uh, but it's still not extremely far away. I mean, it's not that it's not like we're getting 63 and the best is 99, right? Um, yeah, but. I, I was I wanted to discuss um, like one more model that you could try, and you will see that you actually start approaching the like slightly better numbers. But yeah, to answer the question briefly, it, it all depends on the competition and the data. Okay? So sometimes you don't have, you can't get some so much accuracy, and sometimes you can actually get a lot. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you want to give any last pieces of advice on yeah. how to improve the model? Yeah, so I wanted to, I don't, I don't think we have time to actually do it ourselves, but um, we can discuss that. Um, so we had, we, if you remember, we took a look at a uh, third file, the user self-introductions or biographies. So these are vectorized models. And um, we can try putting that too, like 
we can have the ages, the purposes, and then these biographies. And well, we don't have time to do that, but if you actually try that, um, I can actually spoil the answer for you uh, that you can get something like, wait a second. I don't know if you guys can see this. Okay. So if you can see, um, if we use the self introduction, so it's, it's the same, it's the same uh, exact same thing. I'm going to upload this later. We're just uh, adding the biographies of the people. Um, we do the exact same processing and we train the model. It, it, this one takes a bit longer, right? This one takes, took me 34 minutes. And we see that we get an accuracy of 76, right? Which is quite a lot uh, compared to our previous model. So that's the thing about this data. So we have many different data files here. Um, we, we could use all of them. We could use some of them, but we need to be like experimenting different stuff to see which ones are uh, easier to easier or that have more predictive power. Of course, you, it's difficult to add all the data files because uh, that can be too much memory. You don't have to, that much memory in your computer. So you need to you know, play with that. Like, uh, this, is a, this is a very tough, actually, competition um, because we have, it's not just one big file that you need to um, just tune your algorithm to, to get um, a high accuracy. This is one you have to do some data, data analysis. You need to do some data processing. You have to do the whole complete package of data science to actually um, get a decent you know, um, accuracy, right? Mm -hmm. And as I said, I think the best way in this particular competition to increase your accuracy is to start using different uh, data files. Because uh, you, we, could have, we could have tried to um, do hyperparameter tuning on our, the model that we tried before with 63% accuracy, but then we might have got, I don't know, 67 maybe, but if we, if we just used another file, then we could get a lot more. So this is a very real problem. You need to handle a lot, know to, how to handle the data. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna go back here. Um, so yeah, just a few couple of things, last things that I wanted to mention. Um, as you know, we have still uh, a lot of uh, remaining files that we haven't even touched. Um, for example, we have one here that's called user sessions. And if you open it, uh, you will see that you have uh, a user ID and a timestamp, which is uh, when that user um, log into the app. And by using that, for example, one idea could be to count. Uh, so you, you take the 24 hours of the day and for each user, you can get a, an average of what are the hours that each user uh, logins to the app most. So for example, you could see that some people are more of a night person or not night person, but they use the app more at night, some use uh, more in the morning, and you can do the same thing with days of the week, for example. And you can see that some people use the app on weekends and some people use the app on more on weekdays. So those are things that you need to try. And and of course, those are things that tell, tell something about the person, right? So maybe people that use the app on the weekends, I don't know, maybe our model understands that that's something that those, those two people are compatible, you know? Mm. Or if they're both night owls. Yeah, that's the thing. So there are many ways that these data can tell uh, us like, stories about these people. And mm. um, yeah, for example, we have uh, some other files like the education one. This is a bit more tricky because uh, this one, uh, some one person can have more than um, how we have time. I have some. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just gonna just grab that. show it really quick. For sure. Um, questions? We have a few comments in the chat saying it's a great session. Thanks for oh, everything so far. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming. 
this is my first time doing a webinar, so <laughs> I appreciate that a lot. Um, so you can, um, if, we, if we take a look at this data, for example, uh, okay, applications head. So you can see that uh, it looks simple, but we have, well, we have two columns first. Um, though you can see later that the degree one, uh, it's mostly null values. So that's, that's also something that participants need to realize. So when they start looking at this data, they'll see, oh, we have a degree. So that can tell a lot of, uh, a lot of things about the, the user. But then you realize that this uh, column is almost all null values. So we decided to leave it as it's because it's, we think it's part of the challenge. It's part of the whole data science challenge. And you can see here that the uh, one user ID can have um, more than one school ID, right? So let's say this guy went to this, uh, did his bachelor here and then completed a master's in another school. And this number is not fixed. So how do we use this data? Because we need to have one row for each user, right? So how do we put one uh, user, um, how do we put all the school information into one row for each user? So, well, there are a couple ways to handle that too. One thing could be uh, something like uh, one-hot encoding, which basically we would take all the school IDs, so hopefully we don't have uh, too many of them, and we, we have one column for each school ID, and then we sum, we can sum, um, so each user would have a one in the school IDs that he was present. So most users would have a row with almost all zeros and just, for example, this guy would have two ones um, in this, this, this columns. So each, each one of these school IDs would be one column and this guy would have one in that column and one in this column. Okay, so then you would end up with a data frame that could be very big, mm -hmm. um, we don't know. And that's one way to deal with this data, right? There can be another ways. Um, that's that's whole, all part of the data science challenge in, in general. So that's, that's how real data in the real world looks like. And we wanted to make this competition uh, flexible and also challenging, right? So, yeah, and sa well, same thing with the skill, I mean, the skills and the work histories. It also follows a format similar to this one. So you need to decide what to do with the, with the data and how do you handle it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, and of course you can try different algorithms. You can try the, what, an algorithm that I, I like a lot to use uh, is called XGBoost. It's a gradient boosting. It's very powerful. Uh, it's very easy to use too. So yeah, but in general, this competition is uh, it's more aimed at trying to do like the whole data data processing part, right? To know to how to handle data. It's not just hyperparameter tuning. It's more of um, I guess data tuning, future engineering. Yeah, that's the word, future engineering, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So we I don't know how we have time. Maybe we have questions or if you are out of time. Um, Sasha, what do you think on time? Should we wrap up soon or can we take one or two more questions? Yeah, is there any interesting questions you would like to answer? Please go ahead. Sure. I'll take a look now. Um, okay. Oof. So I'm just going to look at the third means to say one hot encoding. Yeah, sorry. My <laughs> yeah, I meant to say that one hot encoding. Uh, there's also something called a pivot table, uh, which is similar because one-hot encoding um, basically means that it's, it's one. So when you have just one category that fills the thing, it's one. Uh, that's the one that becomes a one and then the rest is all zeros. But a pivot table allows us to have more than, um, more than one column with a, with a one. Sorry if that's... <laughs> Difficult to understand. Um, when is the next seminar? We don't know. We have to plan it now. But <laughs> oh, uh, if you if you're interested, uh, there's another competition that we launched, I think today or maybe tomorrow, on the on Bitgrid website. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll be sharing our social media links after this, um, so they yeah, can yeah, keep yeah. 
keep posted on that. Um, we'll also be sharing a link to the recorded session. Mm -hmm. um, so I think somebody just asked that in the chat. So yeah, we, we, we will be posting um, a recorded version of this session later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Naveen Joseph Gabriel asked, wouldn't one hard and cutting on education produce sparse data? Yes, it will. Um, it would. Um, so, but you can handle that in, uh, you can specify that in your hyperparameters. You can, or maybe you can reduce, filter out, for example, schools with uh, too low frequency. So you wouldn't end up with a, such a big data frame. So for example, let's say you have 2000 uh, different schools. Maybe you can filter out the schools that um, don't appear too much and group them into one. And then you will end up with a thousand columns or maybe 500 columns. Um, but yeah, I'm coming across training time programs after doing the text authorization. Any tips on the best way to split a data frame to train the model in a few chunks? Um, okay. Um, okay. So Aaron is already working on the text authorization. Um, um, any ways to, ways to speed a data frame to train the model in a few chunks? Okay, there are many ways to do this. Uh, if it gets into, if, if it gets too big, you can, um, you should, what, what you need to do in these cases when you have a, a data frame that's too big that doesn't fit in memory is to save it in disk. So let's say you have a, a data frame with 500,000 training examples. So they, maybe you can uh, try split that data frame into data frames of 50,000 uh, training examples each. You save, you save them to disk and then you read them one by one. So you read the data frame and you train your model and then you use the same variable that you use uh, to read this, the next um, file and then you keep training the model. Remember that uh, most of these models uh, can be trained uh, incrementally, which means you don't need to give it all the data uh, at once. So you can uh, train it a bit, like use the feed method, and then uh, you can, that, that will create some state of the, your parameters, your, the parameters you are fitting, and then you can retrain it I mean, not retrain it, but like keep training it. So it will adjust even more the parameters. So that, that's what's called incremental training. Uh, I'm not sure if, if with the, the current uh, random forest model that we're using, you can do it like directly. Maybe you, you need to specify some parameters. Also, also another thing that you can do is save the model. Uh, so if you Google, there's many ways that you can save into a file your model, your already trained model. So that way you can uh, use it later or if you run, for example, what could happen if you have uh, problems with memory is that your kernel, your Python kernel dies, but any, all the training that you did uh, gets lost. So what you have to do is try to save that model into a file. You can do that. Uh, there's many ways on the internet on how to do that, but that's very important. So this is, as I said, this is a very challenging uh, competition in general because we have a lot of different types of data, a lot of uh, like a big size in general of the data. So you need to explore different ways uh, to get like the most out of the data that we have. And yeah. And I just asked a follow up to that. Um, do you keep oh, do you keep using the dot fit method to train incrementally, or is there a different method? I'm sorry, repeat that. <laughs> Which one is it? So right here. As a follow up to the answer, do you keep using the feed method to train incrementally, or is there? Uh, I, I don't exactly remember. I think you can uh, use the same one. Uh, but if you look at the documentation, there's probably a line on that. Um, so, yeah, maybe. Uh, sample weight. Okay, yeah. Uh, you need to take, I, I don't remember or not right now, but if you take a look at the, the documentation on Scikit, um, on Scikit Learn, you will see that there's a way to do that, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, hope that answers your question. 
batch uh, entering data and services just random this sample. Mohammed Ali uh, <laughs> um, says, just as he did, one by one, increasing the features in order to try to get max accuracy with as less features as possible. Uh, yeah, so that's it. You have to try to see what features are worth using um, because uh, as you will see, it's very hard to use all these data files. So you need to see which ones are useful, which ones are not, and then how to handle uh, them when it's a lot of data. Um, but in my opinion, the best way to improve this model right here is to work on the data and later you can work on the hyperparameter optimization. Okay. Okay, I think we can wrap it up there. I'm sorry, guys, I, we don't have much time to answer all the questions, but. Actually, never, there is not, not enough time to answer all the questions. It's, it's very <laughs> normal for workshops. Yeah, but we will, upload yeah. sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, we'll be uploading yeah. a recording of today's session. Um, so we shared the links to our uh, YouTube channel and um, Facebook and LinkedIn. So you can follow us there to get that update as soon as it's ready. Um, and also about the new competition that's coming soon. Um, so that's pretty much everything from us, I, I believe, for this time anyway. But um, thank you all for your positive feedback. Yeah. And um, we'll definitely be letting you know if we have any more in the future. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys uh, so much for coming today, um, for your questions. Um, I hope you, you could get a grasp of, uh, on how these competitions are and how this competition in particular can be solved. Uh, you will see that it's not too hard to get a high score. You just need to, you know, try to be a bit smart on how to use data. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you will keep working on this competition, uh, I wish you the best of luck. We will be uploading this, um, this notebook. So, yeah, thank, thanks a lot for coming. Thank, thank you for your comments. And yeah, hope we see, we see you guys. Uh, yeah, thank you so fun. much, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the audience who stayed with us until that late. Um, and thank you so much, of course, uh, to Jorge for delivering an amazing workshop and the rest of the team, Kelly and Truni, who worked very hard behind the scenes answering all the questions. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, yes, as Kelly said, uh, please follow the Big Grid and also Livergon social media challenge, the challenges to uh, keep a track of all the upcoming workshops uh, regarding the data science, the machine learning, and much more. I'm pretty sure guys will have a lot of uh, interest in upcoming competitions, and I wish good luck for all those who decide to participate in the current one and upcoming ones. Thank you so much and have a good night for those who are in their Japan and maybe good evening for those who are in uh, other time zones. Thank you so much and bye. We will wrap, wrap it now. Thanks everyone. Thank bye. you everyone. Thank you, Sasha. See you Thank guys. You. Bye. See you, Tony. Thank you.